since utilities report their you know, have to have to keep their books on an annual basis and report their earnings on an annual basis. Uh, they're setting rates based on a year uh, uh, is considered to make sense. Uh, there's two kinds of test years, generically, historical test years and future test years. My guess is that about two-thirds of the states use historical test years and one-third use future test years. But within the historical test year states, there are a lot of different kinds of historical test year adjustments made. The theory behind a historic, using a historical test year is that costs, revenues, and loads will grow in lockstep. That theory doesn't hold and, and in, in many times and many places, and we spend a lot of time in talking about decoupling, dealing with that underlying theory. Uh, but that's the theory of the historical test year, that if we look at last year and the utility had 10 power plants and 10,000 customers, and we know that next year it's going to have 11 power plants and 11,000 customers, that the cost, the revenues, the expenses will all grow pretty much at the same rate. That's the theory. The historic test year starts with the actual costs as booked by the company. You can actually, this is their actual financial re re reporting, the per book cost, and their actual sales. Uh, to actual customers. There's two sets of adjustments that are done in the historic test year. One is called restating adjustments, and the other are called pro forma adjustments. Restating adjustments are to restate what happened partway through the previous uh, historical year so that they are reflected as though they had occurred all year. So if a uh, large new customer comes onto the system in July, their revenues are restated to an annual basis as though they had been there for the whole year. And if a new power plant came onto the system in July, it is the books are changed to reflect it having been there for a whole year. Uh, and so the restating adjustments put everything that happened that changed during the year, the goal is to put it onto an annual basis. Uh, there are two basic approaches used for that historical test year. One is the average of monthly averages method in which you take each of the 12 months of the year and figure out what things were at at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, end, beginning of the month and end of the month, and take the average of that and average those across 12 months to get your annual basis. Uh, that's what Washington does. It uh, uh, tries to portray as accurately as possible exactly what was going on during 12 months of the test year. Uh, the end of period test rate rate base end of period test year is when and Massachusetts is an example of one of these where everything is restated to December 31st that is it's not put on a annual basis for the whole year but everything is put at December 31st levels and prices uh, utilities prefer end of period it gives them bigger rate base bigger operating expenses but it also gives them more customers than an average of monthly averages approach. And if costs are growing faster than sales, end of period rate base results in a more generous uh, uh, revenue requirement to the utility and promote their service territory expectations by the number of, by the customers that aren't there anymore, reduce their operating expenses by the operating expenses that aren't there anymore. Uh, and uh, you know, if a new generating unit has come online, very typically the thing that triggers a rate case is a new power plant coming online. And that may well need to be in the pro forma because the utility wants to file the rate case in order to have the rates be effective about the time the new power plant comes into service so that they get a rate increase at the same time they have a cost increase. Yeah, uh, that's for a vertically integrated utility, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, and it could as easily be a big new transmission line for you know, or, or an expensive uh, uh, distribution system addition. Uh, so Does it my example. Anything over a, a threshold? Um, I don't know. You know, uh, uh, I'm not an accountant, and so I'm not sure what the typical <laughs> thresholds are. But the accountants fight over these uh, pro forma adjustments. And some are considered de minimis, and others are considered important enough to justify a pro forma adjustment. And I picked the generating units because those are big. Thank you. Uh, the future test year, in some ways, is simpler, uh, but it's all hypothetical. All of the costs, that is the investments, the sales, the number of customers, the operating expenses are forecast to a future year when rates will be in effect. And the utilities argue that this is more realistic uh, because that's when rates are going to be in effect. Uh, the uh, experience is that future test years produce A, higher rates, and B, not particularly different ultimate results of operations. That is ultimate, you know, did the utility earn its allowed rate of return? Oregon is a future test year state. Washington is a historic test year state. A couple of the companies operate in both states. Uh, Northwest Natural Gas, Cascade Natural Gas, and Pacific Power operate in both states. They do future test year cases in Oregon. They do historic test year cases in Washington. They're earned return on equity in Washington is typically about the same as it is in in Oregon. Uh, so they, they seem to produce pretty much this pretty similar results. Uh, but higher rates. Uh, they, uh, but higher higher rates. Uh, you know, my my feeling is as a historic test year advocate is that uh, the future test year, the utility gets to forecast what its labor costs will be, uh, and it has an incentive to forecast high, and the commission has a tendency to chop that down, uh, and the ultimate uh, result is that the utility has less incentive to control its costs. Uh, the future test year advocates would say it's far more realistic. Uh, and it may, I haven't ever seen a, a formal, you know, many state over period of time study of how utilities, whether utilities come closer to, to earning their allowed returns under a future test year or not. Uh, so it may be that there's some, some actual research that shows that my gut instinct based on looking at two adjacent states is, is not accurate. Uh, I probably should have started with this slide, uh, the revenue requirement. The traditional utility revenue requirement is rate base times rate of return plus operating expenses. And there's a lot of things that go into each of those. We'll go over each of those. Uh, uh, but that's the basic formula. The incentive regulation revenue requirement is some kind of how much did you collect last year plus uh, some inflation factor minus some productivity factor plus some growth factor. And the, we'll talk a little bit uh, later about incentive regulation. It can take a lot of forms, but generically it's uh, that kind of a formula. Uh, that is, one doesn't go and look every year at the rate base and, uh, in, in under incentive regulation. The idea is to have a simpler formula that operates in between years that gives the company an opportunity to earn a fair return. So we're going to start by talking about the traditional revenue requirement uh, and, 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 and how, how it gets calculated. The rate base uh, is the total plant and service at original cost. So I bought a transformer 10 years ago for $1,000, less the accumulated provision for depreciation. It's been being depreciated on a 30-year life, so one-third of it has been depreciated away. It's now worth $666. 
So that's the total plant and service at original cost, less depreciation. Then there's a bunch of adjustments to the rate base. One of them is working capital, the amount of cash the company has to have sort of on hand to make sure it can pay its bills when they come in. Uh, sometimes there is an adjustment for things that are allowance for funds used during construction or construction work in progress for, for things that are not yet in service but are being built. Sometimes there are adjustments for regulatory assets. An example of that of regulatory assets is when a power plant, you know, back in the in the nuclear construction era, when utilities were starting work on nuclear plants and then abandoning them uh, before they were finished, and the commissions allowed partial or full recovery of that uh, abandoned investment. Uh, there are a bunch of other kinds of regulatory assets, but uh, they're, they're an adjustment to the rate base. And then deferred taxes. Utilities keep two sets of books. I'm not going to even do a slide on taxes. But utilities keep one set of books for, for federal income taxes and another one for regulators. And that's because they're allowed to take accelerated depreciation for tax purposes, but not in setting rates. So the difference between the two is uh, typically subtracted from the rate base so that the rate payers, in essence, get the, ba the benefit over time of the accelerated depreciation allowance. Those are just examples of the adjustment to, to, to rate base. So here's a numerical example. We had start with the plant and service at original cost. For our utility, $40 million of generation, $10 million of transmission, $60 million of distribution, plant, $20 million of general plant, that's office buildings and trucks and things like that, computers. Uh, so for a total of $130 million of plant and service. Obviously for a non-integrated utility, there would not be generation for a utility who gets all of its transmission through a regional transmission organization, there wouldn't be any transmission. Uh, for gas utilities, there's typically uh, little or no production or transmission plant in their rate base. Uh, they do tend to have storage facilities in their rate base. So gas companies are a little bit, uh, the categories are a little different, but the idea is the same, plant and service at what they originally paid for it across the years. But then there's the depreciation uh, adjustment to that. And what I've put in here is that over the years, this $130 million rate base, uh, see, you know, this doesn't add up very well, does it? Let's just uh, change that so that we... Uh, <coughs> Oh, I, no, that's not what I want to do. Okay, that, that adds up now. Uh, this utility has $130 million of plant in service. Over the years, it has accumulated $30 million of depreciation. So it has $100 million net plant in service. Then we do some adjustments. Working capital adds $5 million. Regulatory assets add a $1 million. Deferred taxes subtract six million. Those happen to exactly offset one another, so we then have the rate base. So there's one of the kernels of the revenue requirement, the rate base. And I should stop here uh, and say, a lot of times people who don't do rate cases use the term power from a wind project would be a purchase power expense, and it would be classified as an operating expense, not as rate base. If the utility owned the wind project, the capital investment would go in the rate base. Now this is a place where the technical language of, of, the, of our profession differs from the common language used by uh, spectators and advanced amateurs of the, uh, of the profession. And we just have to be careful. Wayne, did, did, did you want to jump in on that because I may not have explained it well enough. Well, no, I think you basically got it right. The, the important thing to note is the rate base is really just the net investment the utility has uh, in its capital.
capital, you know, the capital that it's put to use for utility service. Everything else is either an expense or something else, but it's not rate based, even though they all add up together to make up the rate. And these are all things that the regulators have earlier said you may include in rate base, right? Decisions have already been made. Uh, sometimes and sometimes not. Some states have pre-approval of investments, and some states only consider that at the time of a rate case. And the in the first, I'll use Hawaii as an example. Every investment the utility makes over $250,000 has to be pre-approved. So every transmission segment, every substation, uh, every uh, new office building that they open has to have be pre-approved. And then they come in in a rate case and they say, here are my additions to rate base, and they give the docket numbers in which each one was pre-approved. And at that point, the commission is examining only whether what the company bought is what they said they were going to buy when they got pre-approval, and whether the cost is what they said it was co would cost. And if those add up, then there's typically no more debate. Whereas I think most states do not do pre-approval for smaller things. So in Washington, the utility comes into a rate case and said, since our last rate case, we've added $50 million worth of distribution plant and $20 million worth of transmission plant, and oh, we built two new power plants that cost us $500 million, and they ask for inclusion in rate base, and the commission at that time, in the, in the rate case, when they're being added to rates, when the rates are actually going up, goes through the entire prudence review. Did you buy the right thing? Did you pay the right amount of money for it? And is it actually providing service? So in some cases there's been pre-approval, in some case, cases it's decided in the rate case itself, and that varies by jurisdiction. Does that answer your question, Kathy? Well, I, I, actually, I thought what you just said indicated that they really couldn't consider it rate-based until the commission agreed. That's not the same as pre-approving that they spent money on it. But and maybe I'm wrong about this, but um, I thought even that example you just got, you just gave, was saying they're coming in, they're saying they spend these millions of dollars on distribution, and it's up to the commission to say at that point whether they can add that to rate base or not. Well, actually, there's there's an accounting answer and a regulatory answer. Okay, all right. The accounting answer is the utility adds what it invested to the rate base that it reports for financial reporting purposes as of the date it becomes plant in service. That is, things, while they're under construction or classified as construction work in progress, the day it enters service and is declared commercially operating, it gets transferred to plant in service. It, the utility starts accumulating depreciation expense for it, expensing it. It may not get a rate increase for it until there's a rate case but it becomes rate-based and plant and service from an accounting perspective immediately. Well, I want to quibble with that a little bit. In accounting terms, there's no such thing as rate-based. Rate-based rate is strictly used in the rate-making context. It's the same numbers. I mean, yeah. we're talking about what their investments are, but they, the company might have a billion dollars invested but only get $900 million of it into the, their rate base at the commission because the other hundred million is for something else. Or yes, that's it, costing money. When it goes into service, it is transferred from construction work into progress to plant and service. And Those are the account that's, the account, that's where the accounting ends. And then the regulator decides in a future rate case what the rate base is as of that rate case. Yeah, that, thanks, Wayne. So our utility has a $100 million rate base when we're done with plant and service minus accumulated depreciation plus the adjustment. So that's the first kernel. The second kernel is the rate of return. The, you know, in traditional rate of return regulation, the cost of capital 
as a bunch of components, the cost of common equity, the equity capitalization ratio, the cost of debt, the debt ratio, that is what percentage of the capital is equity and what percentage is debt. And those of you who bought a house and put 20% down started out at 20% equity and 80% debt. And so those ratios are, are understood. And then there's some other things, preferred stock, short-term debt, uh, some complicated financing instruments uh, that get factored in also. I'll try and keep this uh, simpler uh, and just focus on the equity and, and, and debt elements. Uh, and these get quibbled over, all right? A utility uh, has some of its capital is provided by shareholders and some is provided by bondholders, by debt providers. Some of it is bonds and some of it is notes, but we call it all debt. Uh, and this hypothetical that I've done, I probably should update because the industry has moved sort of from a 40% to a 50% equity ratio generally, but I calculated this at a 40% equity ratio, that is the utility is 40% of its capital comes from shareholders uh, and 60% comes from in the form of, of borrowing of debt. And the regulator has to decide <coughs> both the equity ratio, how much of the capital is or should be provided from equity, and the cost of equity. What is the cost that shareholders require to be willing to invest in the utility? And here I've uh, given a uh, what in today's market would be a pretty equity ratio is actually kind of important. Uh, but you get you multiply the 40% times 10%. The weighted cost of equity is 4%. The other 60% of the company's capital comes from debt. Debt is typically cheaper than equity. I put in 8%. Uh, and so we have a weighted cost of debt of 4.8. The sum, the allowed rate of return for the utility, not the return on common equity, which is 10%, but the overall rate of return is 8.8% .8 for, for our hypothetical utility. Uh, um, each of these items is deliberated by the commission, but we have here the second kernel of our revenue requirement, the rate of return. And then the third piece of it is the operating expenses. Uh, some of these could obviously for an integrated utility could be production operating expenses, fuel and employees to run the power plants, transmission operation and maintenance expenses, the people that maintain the uh, uh, transmission plants, distribution operating expenses, administrative and general expenses, uh, the executives and the outside services employed. Uh, I have, I'm going to um, change something here on the screen because I left out an important category of expenses and I'm not going to change the total. Uh, I left out depreciation expense, the annual cost associated with the depreciation of the capital stock so that the utility return, re, re, recovers its investment over time in addition to receiving a return on the undepreciated value. So I added, I added $3 million of depreciation expense, but to keep the math adding up, I uh, 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 took it out of uh, distribution expense. Uh, but depreciation expense is one of those operating expenses. I've put income taxes down here in the operating expenses. The income taxes are a function of the cost of equity and the equity capitalization ratio, 
and are a function of the amount of debt because the interest on debt is deductible. So the rate of return calculation is interactive with the income tax calculation. Uh, when, when the utility, when, when the consumer advocate proposes a different capital structure or a different rate of return, they also propose different income taxes to go with it. Uh, and Can I jump in for a Sure. It, I think it's also useful to take note that while there's a piece in there for depreciation, which represents money coming into the utility when it's included in rates, there's no cash expense associated with that. So this is a case where the utility is collecting something where there's not a cash outflow at that time. In fact, the cash outflow occurred when they invested the money into the plant to begin with. And typically, when, when the utility looks at its construction budget, it will say that we can fund a third of it with internally generated funds, by which they mean the depreciation expense, typically, and that they're going to have to go to the capital markets for, for, for the balance. Typically, the depreciation expense in a growing utility is smaller than the capital additions or the replacements. And part of it is that my transformer that cost me $1,000 10 years ago, when it wears out in 20 years, I will have collected $1,000 of depreciation expense for it, but the new transformer that I buy to replace it might cost me $3,000. And so even the depreciation expense that I've collected may not be adequate to pay for the, trans the, the replacement unit. Uh, there is not a cash expense associated with depreciation, but there is continuing the utility. There's continuing capital investment every year. It gets used up. Utilities tend to issue more stock and more bonds over time because their internally generated cash is not sufficient to pay for all their expansion. But anyway, so here's this is the third kernel of our revenue requirement, so we're now able to calculate the whole revenue requirement. We have a $100,000 rate base. We have an 8.8% .8 rate of return, so we have $8.8 .8 million of return requirement. We've got uh, uh, $24 million worth of uh, operating expenses, and so our revenue requirement is $32,800,000 for this hypothetical utility. Uh, that gets us through the, the three kernels of, uh, of the revenue requirement. I'm now going to give a very quick example of one possible method for an incentive regulation uh, framework. An incentive regulation, and I'll talk more about this later uh, if, if, we, if we have time and interest, uh, is a way of adjusting revenue over a period of typically multiple years, three or five or even seven years, uh, without doing a full rate case. Uh, the utility, in this case, the historical revenue from last year was $30 million. We add inflation to it of a million and a half, growth to it of 3% of 900,000 for new customers, uh, and productivity at 2% is an offset to that, and our new revenue allowance is $32 million. Came out a little bit less, uh, but pretty close to the same result as the full rate case. And Wayne, you started to say something here. No, I would I oh. Okay. Uh, and this is just one method of, of incentive regulation. It's just an alternative to doing a full rate case. They take a lot of forms. I've got a, a whole presentation on it, and, and we can do parts for all of that a little later. And, but as part of what's been important about this form is that if a utility can improve its productivity beyond the 2%, they get to keep anything extra. Correct. If the utility can hold its expense growth to less than the rate of inflation, it gets to keep the proceeds. It doesn't have to come in for a rate case every year. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's you know in this situation, if the utilities cost, if inflation was the big, and in, in, in this one, inflation is the big driver. Let's just assume hypothetically that the growth in sales also pays for the growth in cost. That those are moving in lockstep, then the inflation net of productivity is still about a four percent increase in the utilities rates for. The uh, there's 1.1 million out of 30 million, uh, and the utility would have to come in for regular rate cases without some kind of a rate plan in place. Uh, and this is almost exactly the kind of rate plan that the Massachusetts, some of the Massachusetts utilities are on right now. Uh, I think it's uh, Bay State has a seven or ten year. Uh, uh, performance-based regulation plan uh, that I wouldn't have termed performance-based, but they do. Uh, and it, it, it's intended to keep them out of a full rate case for seven years. That gives the management more time to focus on cost control. It gives the regulators uh, fewer cases to hear, and they can do a more thorough job hearing the ones that are before them with the resources that the commission has. So there's benefits to uh, to both sides, in theory, uh, of an incentive, a multi-year rate plan of some kind. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that the regulator actually regulates. Uh, first of all, with respect to rate base, they look at is this rate base providing service or not. That is, if the utility has both a utility operation and a real estate uh, management and leasing operation, they might say, well, you know, the headquarters building is 10% used for the real estate leasing operations, and so we're going to only allow 90% of the headquarters building into rate base. Only 90% is providing service to electric consumers. I'll, I'll get to service. Uh, in the context of a rate case, the, the biggies are the rate base, the rate of return, and the operating expenses. Did somebody just join us? No, that was me, actually. That's you. Listen to that on the keyboard. So the rate base, commission's regulating. New plant additions. When p- new power plants or transmission lines or other facilities enter service, they're examined for prudence in acquisition and construction. Commissions are looking at this a lot in the context of smart grid acquisitions right now. And some companies are being very hesitant to invest in uh, uh, automation without commission buy-in early on uh, because the costs are pretty high, the benefits are pretty long-term. Uh, and you know, California had a huge case that... Uh, ultimately resulted in the companies being allowed to invest, I think it was a total of $10 billion in advanced metering infrastructure. Uh, and the consumer advocate was completely opposed to it. In that case, it was a pre-approval case, and the commission ruled in favor of acquisition. The next step would be in a rate case, the utility would come in, okay, I bought my $6 billion worth of advanced metering infrastructure, and the commission would examine, did you buy it prudently? Is it working? Is it doing what it was supposed to do? Uh, did it cost what it was supposed to cost? And that new plant would be added to the rate base. Typically, generation has been subject to the most scrutiny. Uh, nuclear plants and coal plants, both as to whether they were uh, the least cost resource acquisition and whether they were needed at the time that they came into service, were they excess capacity. Typically, distribution plant has been the least examined. I think that's changing for two reasons. Uh, first of all, a lot of utilities don't do generation. They're restructured. Uh, but also, the amount of money that's being invested in uh, in smart grid investments is just making a lot more of the investment show up on the distribution side. And if that's where the money is, that's where the commission's going to look. Uh, in the 80s, a lot of commissions set up phase-in plans for new generation. That is, they 
didn't let the utility recover the whole cost when the plant first went into service. Uh, they made them phase it in over a period of two or three or five, even ten years. Sometimes they uh, let them eventually catch up, that is to in the later years recover what had been deferred in the early years. In some cases they didn't. And in one case, uh, that I think Wayne Smalley was closer to, he was physically certainly closer to it, uh, the New Mexico Commission denied public service of New Mexico, including part of a nuclear plant in rates. Uh, and was the company was told, you can go sell this power anywhere you want for whatever you can get for it. It can be a non-regulated part of your business. So it was Palo 3, is that right, Wayne? Yeah, that was Palo Verde, actually Palo Verde 2 and 3. Um, go all the way back to find out that a couple of the coal plants were excess capacity too, but yeah, yeah that was the case. And the company lost money on them for many, many years because the power could be sold for less than the full cost of production. Uh, in today's, well, I don't know about today, but a year ago, they were making buckets of money off of that because the wholesale power market was way above the cost of the power from, the, from Palo 2 and 3. And they were making a pile of money off of it. Now, generation historically, as they said, been the most subject to subject to most scrutiny. But uh, once something gets in through rate base, once the regulator has approved it, it seldom gets challenged later unless it breaks. And the most common kind of breaking is when a power plant has a major outage that you know goes on for months and months. And the regulatory experience in those is mixed, mostly in favor of the utilities. The commission very seldom takes a plant out of rate base if it's out of service for six months or a year or a year and a half. Partly because the rate cases may not be filed. And if the company has a fuel and purchase power adjustment mechanism, it uh, and most do, it winds up with rates that have the power plant that's not working in base rates and the replacement power cost flowing through the fuel and purchase power adjustment clause. Now, in Washington, when we put together the most recent fuel and purchase power adjustment clause, it doesn't allow flow through if the coal plants uh, fall below a certain level of of reliability. Uh, and to, to specifically address this, but in my experience, those kinds of provisions are pretty rare. In most cases, I mean, in Hawaii, we had a power plant out of service for two and a half years, and the lights were going out on the big island every Monday afternoon. I mean, they were literally doing rolling blackouts every Monday because they had a shortage of, of capacity. Uh, and the company was allowed to leave the broken power plant in rate base and charge customers for the higher fuel cost of the backup power plants that were running as hard as they could. Uh, and the customers were suffering outages. And in my opinion, the Hawaii Commission didn't do its job there. Uh, but, you know, particularly since it was two and a half years. Uh, but when power plants break for six months or, or four months, it's pretty unusual for the commission to, to do anything. Uh, those are some of the things that the commission regulates in the rate base. Next time I'm going to talk about some of the things the commission regulates in the rate of return. The cost of equity, as I said, is the most hotly contested item of the rate of return in a rate case. It's pretty subjective. That is, the question being asked is, what return do equity investors require in order to attract them to the stock. Uh, there are a number of different calculation methods used. They produce different results. Different companies are thought to be comparable to different kinds of companies by different analysts. You know, the answer comes out to, in the U.S. typically to right now, somewhere in the 
ten and a half percent plus or minus one percent range. That is between uh, nine and a half percent and eleven and a half percent is where commissions are coming down right now. With Arkansas at the low end and California and Hawaii at the high end. Uh, but the commission also regulates the capital structure. Sometimes the utility will have had a big write-off for some reason, uh, and or, or several years in a row of adverse weather, and its actual equity will be very depressed. We had a company that was down to 30% equity in Washington. The commission set their rates based on 40% equity but required them to meet certain targets to rebuild their capital structure. Giving a utility rates based on a hypothetical capital structure is, in essence, giving them a return on capital that isn't being provided. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an act of generosity by the commission. The most difficult thing that commissions are dealing with now in setting the capital structure is dealing with the holding companies that exist. You know, uh, uh, Bay State Gas in, in, in Massachusetts is owned by NISource, which also owns Northern Indiana Gas. Uh, you know, two systems that are not contiguous, uh, have no gas facilities in common. Uh, and uh, where you have a holding company, the commission has to decipher. You can't actually measure what capital is being used to supply which companies. If you have a holding company that has a casino operation and a utility operation, just to pick two different industries that have very different risk profiles, the casino industry requires a very high level of equity because the returns are uncertain. Uh, and in a recession, the customers uh, may not show up at all. Uh, whereas a utility has a very stable demand, typically, and has historically been allowed to have much more leverage. Well, if the holding company is 60% debt, 40% equity, and it asserts that all of our subsidiaries are 60-40, uh, the commission may say, oh, okay. But then it turns out that the holding company is 60% debt, 40% equity, and that 40% equity owns the equity of the of the utility, and then the utility is 60% debt, 40% equity, and it turns out that the utility is double leveraged. That is, the utility has debt of its own, and then the holding company is supplying the equity with part debt and part equity. Commissions are dealing with this double leverage issue a lot right now, uh, as as the utilities have been consolidating and merging and uh, Sam Insel's empire is, is being rebuilt. Uh, and the decisions by commissions have been all over the map on double leverage. Uh, uh, in Oregon, they've been fairly tough on it. In Washington, they've been pretty weak on it. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the, going to be one of the biggest regulatory issues going forward. I don't profess to be an expert in it, uh, but I think it's going to be a biggie. Can you just very quickly state how the holding company double leverages that? I, I think I missed one connect the dot thing there. All right. Well, let me let me take it out of the utility context and see if I can make an example of it, okay? I am a real estate investor, okay? I uh, invest $50,000 in a partnership that owns an office building. And there's 10 other partners, and we've each invested $50,000, and we've invested half a million dollars in the office building. And then the partnership goes out and borrows another half a million dollars we have a million dollars, we buy the office building. That office building is 50% equity provided by the 10 partners and 50% debt owed to a bank. Yep. All right. I'm the investor. I now go to my bank and I say, 
I own 10% of this partnership. It's worth $50,000. I'd like to borrow $25,000 from the bank in order to uh, buy this share of the limited partnership. So I now have $25,000 of my money invested plus $25,000 of the bank's money invested in the share of the limited partnership. And if each of the other partners does the same thing, then in fact the partners have only put up $250,000 of their own capital, and one and the banks have put up $750,000. It's okay. three quarters leveraged. The holding company structure is basically the same thing. The holding company borrows money by selling bonds in order to invest in the equity of the utility, but the utility itself on its own books also issues bonds to, uh, to pay for its facilities. And so if you actually work all the way through the capital structure, you find that there is more debt and less risk capital invested, which is important for a number of reasons. One is if you have multiple bad years in a row, how much cushion is there before somebody gets foreclosed on by their bank? Uh, you know, how much interest has to be paid regardless of the performance of the company uh, before somebody goes broke? And another is that the debt interest is tax deductible. And if the utility is being allowed to collect rates based on 50% equity and the taxes on that equity, but the owners are actually financing it with 25% equity and 50% and, and, and 75% debt, they're incurring less tax and than the utility is actually collecting in rates. And the ratepayers wind up paying the utility for taxes that never get paid to the government. And the commission has to look through that holding company capital structure to see how much real equity is there and how much real taxes are being paid. Commissions haven't gotten very good at it. And I don't think the courts have really dealt with it enough to give the commission's confidence in what the right thing to do is. Wayne, do you want to comment on that? Well, the, I guess there's a, a useful historical connection here. It's, you may have run across the name Sam Insull from time to time, who is um, somewhat lambasted by regulatory historians. But he's a guy that built up an enormous empire of electric utilities across the U.S. And it was like a layered, multi-layered double leveraging phenomenon. And for very, a very small amount of money, he basically controlled the entire electric industry. Uh, and that led to um, legislation, depression era legislation that uh, the Public Utility Holding Company Act that broke up all those companies. And that's why we basically have one utility. You know, mostly utilities are in one state, or they used to be. Now we've rolled all that back, and they're starting to merge again. So, yeah, his original company was the Electric Bond and Share Company. Uh, that was that was the uh, the company at the top of the pyramid, uh, and Ebasco is still around. It is a utility uh, engineering and consulting services company. Is what it's still doing. Uh, and they were the architect engineering firm for a number of nuclear power plants. Uh, and uh, his original company is still around. Sam is long gone. Uh, but his empire, I think, is being rebuilt. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mid American, which is a Nebraska company owned by Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, in part, uh, issues debt uh, to own the stock of Pacific Corp, which is a electric utility holding company that has operating utilities in six western states, uh, and figuring out their their capital structure really requires going all the way back to Berkshire Hathaway to see where how much real 
real equity is at risk here. Um, because Berkshire owns Mid-America and Mid-America owns Pacific. Pacific owns Rocky Mountain Power and Rocky Mountain Power owns power plants and distribution lines. It, it, it's going to, it is interesting, it's going to stay interesting uh, as, as commissions figure this out. Yeah, thanks. This explains, I, I, I was working on a case in Oregon, I remember, and now this all makes sense to me, where, right. where the consumers were trying to get their money. The purchase power clause, uh, outside services employed. If in the historic test year the company had very high litigation costs uh, or, uh, or, or, or engineering costs, uh, the commission may say, are those likely to be the same next year? And may disallow a portion of, of those expenses. Uh, storm damage costs. You know, utilities have big storms. They don't have them every year. Uh, different states deal with that in different ways. Most states allow utilities to either have a storm damage reserve that builds up over multiple years and then gets drawn down when there's a big storm, or after the fact, if there's a really big storm, the utility is expected to go out and repair the system immediately to get the lights back on and then come to the commission and say we spent $30 million on storm damage restoration. It doesn't actually increase the value of any of our plant in service. We had a brand new pole and it broke. You know, we, we hadn't appreciated it away yet, but we had to replace it with a new pole. Uh, so now we've got an old pole that's of no value that was still in rate base for $1,000 and a brand new pole that cost us 1200 and there, two of them are doing the job of one pole. How do we handle this? And commissions generally allow them to amortize over multiple years. Uh, but even storm damage can be very, very contested. In Hawaii in 1992, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Aniki, that basically destroyed the entire power system on the island of Kauai. Uh, not one customer had service. Uh, every transmission line was down. Not, not a, no kilowatt hours could leave the power plant. The power plants themselves were relatively undamaged. Uh, and it did a fair amount of damage on the big island. The two utilities took very different approaches. On the island of Kauai, the utility immediately called in extra crews, chartered airplanes, started flying over people and equipment, and started restoring the system. And they said, we'll talk to the commission later about who's gonna, how we're going to pay for all this. Uh, and they hustled. On the big island, the utility did not authorize any overtime for system restoration until they had received an accounting order from the commission authorizing them to defer and amortize the storm damage costs. And while the damage was much greater on Kauai, the restoration speed was about the same on the two islands. It took about six weeks before everybody was restored to service in both places, even though there was 10 times as much damage on Kauai. And if, if I had been the commission, I would have uh, uh, not uh, been as gentle on the Big Island utility as the Hawaii Commission was. I would have said, sorry folks, getting the power back on is job one. And you know, you're going to be penalized for every day that you're not providing service uh, that you could have been. Uh, ultimately, the island, the Kauai utility was allowed to recover its full storm damage costs, but so was the Big Island utility. The commission, in my opinion, didn't do their job uh, in regulating the utility on the Big Island. They could have had that system put together in a week, and they just didn't authorize any overtime until they had an accounting order. Uh, uh, that's the worst example of, of a commission not being tough with a company that I can recall. You got a better story, Wayne? Oh, I don't know. Let's move on. <laughs> hey, hey, Jim, I have a couple questions. Okay. On a purchase power adjustment clause, that passes outside of OPEX and goes straight into rates? Yeah. Um, is there any kind of ex post review on that? Yes. 
prudent? Uh, yeah, there's a, the power supply fuel and purchase power adjustment clauses have typically have their own proceedings. Typically, and same with purchase gas adjustment. There's a separate proceeding for those. They happen most often once a year. Uh, and there tends not to be a lot of controversy because the methods tend to have been established over a long period of time. Uh, but sometimes there are very big issues over them. Uh, and, you know, I've been involved in a number of power supply prudence review cases uh, where companies have had portions of their cost disallowed. And I've been involved in some where companies asserted that the methodology allowed them to charge a hypothetical rate for fuel or purchase power when they, in fact, didn't incur it. Uh, and in some cases, the commission have stepped in and said, no, uh, if you didn't incur that cost, the ratepayers don't pay that cost. Uh, and in some, the commissions have let them uh, retain the benefits of their visionary, creative, and 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 risky act activities. My second question is um, environmental compliance expense. Is that in OPEX, or does that pass through like a power purchase agreement uh, adjustment clause? most cases it's uh, an operating expense. Some commissions have established pass-through clauses for environmental compliance expense. Uh, you know, for example, when the gas companies were forced to clean up their former manufactured gas sites, or the tar pits as we called them, where they were manufacturing, making manufactured gas out of coal or petroleum, and they had Superfund sites. Commissions established pass-through mechanisms for that. Some states have lots of pass-through mechanisms. Minnesota has, I think, seven or eight that we ran into when we were doing work there on decoupling. California has 17. Washington has one for fuel and purchase power, one for energy efficiency, one for the wind tax credit, uh, and one for the Bonneville exchange power adjustment, uh, but none for environmental compliance costs. So part of OPEX. Thank you. Feel free to punt this next question to another time, but um, given that we all know that we need to change over the fleet, um, an environmental dispatch isn't going to get us there without exorbitantly high costs. Um, any thoughts on how we can change that paradigm to maybe have the utility be on the hook and give them some kind of incentive to change over the fleet? Because if they're just passing it through to the customer, that doesn't seem real effective. Uh, well, I think that is a much bigger, bigger topic, and I, I kind of anticipated that in the category that we put in the in the the third one of these, you know, current issues and regulation. Uh, and I, I just sort of listed it as the, the whole CO2 thing, uh, but it's uh, it's it's more than that. Okay, uh, that's fine. Thank you. We just couldn't understand uh, Ben's question. Change over to to what? Getting rid of all the old beater coal plants and putting something shiny, new, and clean in their place. Oh. The fleet. The fleet. The fleet. Okay. Uh, is how uh, that's that's the question I was answering anyway. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the one that was being asked. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, uh, then there's some other things that commissioners regulate, particularly in performance-based regulation and multi-year rate plans, where the commission is with, is expecting the company to not file a general rate case frequently. Commissions have adopted service quality indexes and service quality measures. And Barbara Alexander, who was a, was a regular RAP associate, although she, I don't think she ever, ever made our website, uh, but she was the former consumer services director for the Maine Commission uh, and still does a lot of consulting for particularly. And so when you got put on hold for half an hour, it was costing you 50 cents a minute? That includes phone sex, or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, you got you, 
you got bad, you got shoe store music. <laughs> uh, uh, honest to God, the phone company came up with creative ways to to simultaneously reduce their operating expenses and increase their revenues while just trashing customer service. Instead mm-hmm. of when your phone broke, it took they got out there that day to fix it. They would get out there a week later to fix it, and. It was really, really bad for Quest. And in response to the, and that same sort of thing happened in a lot of other places. And so the, the lesson uh, we learned in, with the 1990 Quest uh, multi-year rate plan is when we negotiated a merger between a gas and electric company, uh, and part of the deal was a five-year rate plan, we also made part of the deal the service quality measurement. How frequently did people suffer outages? How long were the outages? How long did it take the company to answer the phone when you called? How uh, long did it take the gas company to get to the scene if you called and said you smelled gas? How many customers were disconnected for non-payment, which was a measure of how good a job the company was doing working with its customers and getting them into payment assistance programs and working out uh, payment plans with them. Uh, how long did it take customers to get reconnected once they'd been disconnected and had, had met the credit or payment requirement? All of these got rolled up into a service quality index. And in the case of, of our company, a report card that had to be sent to all ratepayers once a year as to how they were doing on achieving the index. There were financial penalties for failure to meet the index and multi-year failure to meet the index was grounds for reopening the multi-year rate package. Uh, and so this was the commission stepping into an area where they had sort of regulated on a complaint basis before. If customers complained, the commission would uh, either have an informal adjudication or a formal adjudication with the company. But if there weren't specific formal complaints filed, they the commission didn't do much, changed it into there was an actual service quality standard and tariff and measurement evaluation and penalty. Uh, the commission still does regulate by complaints. You know, when, if complaints are filed, they will, the commissions will, will investigate and have either a formal or informal process for resolving it. But the service quality index is a, uh, you know, sort of came up on I'm going to say about 15 years ago uh, when they were first beginning. And then obviously there's a big issue that we do a lot of uh, in, in RAP, which is the regulator regulating resource planning. You know, prior to 1990, there were a lot of utilities that built a lot of power plants that might not have been the right thing to build at the right time. And there were a bunch of excess capacity cases. There were also companies that were short on capacity and were having very high purchase power expenses because they had not planned adequate capacity or their power plants had been delayed due to either uh, uh, environmental regulation, construction problems, or other problems uh, and didn't come online when they were expected. I'm going to say that the Pacific Northwest led the nation and integrated resource planning. Uh, the first one was done uh, for the region in about 1975 uh, by a four-state uh, uh, governor's committee. Uh, it became part of federal law with the passage of the Northwest Power Act in 1980, and the Northwest Power and Conservation Council is in the midst of finishing up their sixth power plan, in which they conclude that 80 percent of our future power needs can be met with conservation alone, and basically the balance with wind. Uh, 80% can meet all demands? 80% 80, 80 of our future power needs can be met with conservation, and the balance can be met with wind. Not growth in, in demand, but total demand. Total, total increase in resources, that is, some power plants and contracts wear out and expire mm. and have to be replaced. And all of the retiring resources plus all of the load growth is the new resource requirement. And 80% of that total can be met with conservation. 
and the balance was wind. Six power plant is a great piece of work. 500 average megawatts of savings in televisions alone. And if you haven't been to see the new Samsung LED TV at your local Sears or Best Buy, you got to go check it out. It is a great leap forward in television. One third of the electricity of a of an LCD, one sixth of the electricity of a plasmatron, and better picture than either. Can we do a cash for clunkers? Uh, <laughs> the job of the council is identif identifying the cost-effective resource that's available. The job of Bonneville and the utilities is figuring out how to acquire it. Do you have cash for clunkers? Uh, do you have uh, a code or standard? Do you have uh, uh, a incentive program targeted at the TV uh, 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 salesman? Uh, I used to sell stereo gear, and we had stiffs on products that they wanted to move. Uh, you know, I mean, how, how you accomplish it is, is is probably beyond the commission's role. But the where this will come to the commission is. If Puget Power is proposing to build a new gas-fired power plant and isn't proposing to acquire these, to secure this cost-effective television resource that's much cheaper, the commission may say, no, your IRP isn't good enough. You have to come up with an IRP that fully considers all of the demand-side resources that are available to you and how, how, what's the best way to get them. That's what IRP and lease cost planning are. It's a mix of supply and demand resources. Some commissions approve the integrated resource plan. Uh, Hawaii does. Uh, and others accept it, and, and Washington is one of those, where the plan is found to be consistent with uh, what's required by law, but the commission reserves the right to sort of review the prudence of what's done under the plan in rate cases. Uh, and some of them only they, acknowledge, or some acknowledge the plan. And in some cases, Washington, while it never approves the plan, it has rejected a couple of plans uh, as not meeting. Mm -hmm. the basic requirements of the law. That is not adequately considering a mix of demand-side resources. Uh, obviously, you know, the next step of this resource planning stuff is putting into, get into place the conservation programs and funding mechanisms that are needed to implement the plans. plans. It's kind of cool to be able to actually be running the software so I can edit one screen. Uh, I mean, was something that we could use for more sophisticated purposes, obviously, in a, in a webinar framework of actually building up a spreadsheet and an example on the screen with people. Uh, uh, you know, efficiency Vermont is one. Uh, we don't have anything like that in Washington. The utilities are doing all the, the resource funding directly and managing the programs themselves, and there's a bunch of ways of doing it, and RAP talks about those uh, quite a bit. Uh, I want to sort of wrap up this uh, introduction to regulation, uh, Regulation 101, with what is a rate proceeding and how do they work. Uh, how many of you have been involved in a utility rate case? Uh, and I don't know how many are out there. I, you know, Ben and Kathy have been talking, and uh, I'm not sure who all is left. I never have. Rebecca never has. Nope. In, indirectly. Carol has. Okay. All right. Well, there's, you know, there's a bunch of parts to the rate case. There's, first of all, the filing requirements that are set up by the commission, and then there's the procedure for deciding it all. Uh, and uh, there's the issues that are allowed to be con considered. Uh, you know, the, the procedure typically involves the company 
makes a filing, typically for a rate increase. There's a discovery phase where you get to ask the company questions. You then get to prepare your own evidence. I'm going to assume you are that you are the consumer advocate for for this purpose. That you are a party to the proceeding, but neither the company nor the commission. You get to ask the company questions and get them to provide documents. That's discovery. You get to prepare your own evidence. Uh, you get to write your own testimony, prepare your own exhibits, and propose your own alternative to what the company is proposing. Uh, typically, the company then gets to file rebuttal evidence to that. Uh, in most states, once all of the written evidence has been presented, there is a single hearing at which all of the witnesses for all of the parties are cross-examined, normally starting with the company witnesses, then going to the commission or attorney general or an, a consumer advocate and intervener witnesses, and then often ending again with the company witnesses going last. They have whoever files the case has the burden of proof, and they have sort of the right to go last. Uh, at the end of the hearing, there's a closing argument, typically written briefs, sometimes with oral argument as well before the commission, and then a decision. Some states, like California, all of this takes place before a hearing examiner, uh, which is what Meg was. And the hearing examiner then prepares a proposed decision, and the parties write exceptions to the proposed decision, and then the proposed decision and the exceptions go to the commissioners, and the commissioners actually then may render a decision. In Washington, there is a hear and read rule. The commissioners are required to hear and read substantially all of the evidence in a proceeding. So the hearing takes place in front of the commissioners, uh, and the commissioners review the final briefs or the oral argument, and the commissioners together reach a decision. And you know that those are the way two states do it. Uh, I think they're kind of the bookends. Uh, terms of involvement of the commissioners. California has the least involvement of the commissioners. I think Washington probably is at the other extreme. Jim, in the latter example, where you've got the commissioners with uh, you know, the read in yeah. here or whatever you call it, do they also have a hearing examiner that kind of orchestrates or manages, or does it function more like a, a, a panel of hearing officers? Uh, Washington does have a hearing examiner who manages the proceeding, marks the exhibits, numbers the exhibits, rules on the the legal motions that are made. You know, if, if the company moves to strike my testimony because I was off subject, the hearing examiner rules on that. In Idaho, the commissioners run the hearing. There is no hearing examiner. The law requires that at least one of the commissioners be an attorney. Uh, and typically they function as the hearing, that commissioner functions as the hearing examiner. Uh, uh, and I would say that the Idaho proceedings are less orderly than the Washington ones as a result. Thank you. Not that the results are better or worse. The filing requirements vary by jurisdiction, and states have gotten pretty smart. Uh, and when I first started doing this, Washington had no filing requirements, and the company could file whatever it wanted to, and then we had to figure out everything we needed to ask it for in discovery, and then they would fight with us over every single item, and it would eat up the first several months of a proceeding to just get the raw data that we needed to just do a normal rate case. Now most commissions have very strict filing requirements. That when you file a rate increase, uh, in Washington is defined as 3% increase in revenues in one application or accumulatively over a three-year period. Anything that causes base rates to go up by more than 3% since the last general rate case, you have to meet the filing requirements. You have to provide a whole bunch of historical cost data, projected cost data, usage data, customer data, expense data, uh, a list of the large additions to rate base, 
uh, you know, the proposed rates and tariffs. There's just a whole long list of things that have to be filed. It uh, works out to about 2,000 pages uh, to meet the minimum filing. A copy of the company's annual report to shareholders, copy of the company's first form one filing to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, copy of the company's last 10K filing to the Securities and Exchange Commission. You know, a lot of the bulk is documents that are already publicly available, uh, but they're required to be filed with the rate case, or in some cases, uh, within 14 days of filing the, the rate case in some states. They give you, you can file the rate case and you file the supporting documentation a little bit later. Uh, the, you know, the issues in the rate filing are all the things that we've just talked about that the commission regulates. The amount of the revenue requirement, the cost allocation of the, that revenue requirement between customer classes, rate design within customer classes. Uh, those are two topics that I was sort of prepared to discuss today, but I think we maybe don't have time to get into them at all and need to save those for another day. Uh, and I, that would be my preference because I think that they're enough current issues there that we ought to do a good job on it. There's all the service policies, the line extension policy is an example of that, the uh, conservation programs are an example of that, uh, are up for discussion in a general rate case. There's the service quality issues that Barbara Alexander has worked on, there's an assortment of other tariff issues. Uh, that get dealt with the treatment of very large customers, sometimes get some kind of special treatment, uh, allowing customer, some customers to go to market for power while others receive bundled service. The in restructured uh, areas, the treatment of default service becomes you know, an issue in a general rate filing. Uh, the framework of the fuel adjustment, fuel and purchase power adjustment mechanism. If you want to change how the fuel clause works, the general rate case is the place to do that. Uh, so, you know, basically everything is up for grabs in a general rate case. That's the time that most commissions think that any change in what's now being done should be addressed. Wayne, that, this actually is a good one to, for, for Wayne to add some other issues to. I'm sorry, which one, Jim? Well, I've got issues on the rate filing, and I'm just kind of wondering if you wanted to add any additional issues that uh, are, are good rate case topics. Uh, well, there's always the out-of-period adjustment stuff over there. And staff put on a full... Uh, case and the consumer advocate is a statutory party, that is the law says that they are a party. Uh, and they put on a partial, they, 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 they address some issues but not all issues. And then there's interveners uh, who are uh, ask permission, although under federal law any consumer has the right to intervene. The interveners ask the commission permission to participate and are almost always granted that, uh, and that could be the Washington Industrial Committee for Fair Utility Rates representing industrial customers, the Building Owners and Managers Association, BOMA, representing commercial customers, the Energy Project representing low-income consumers, Fair Electric Rates Now, which is a conservation advocacy group. Uh, or the Northwest Energy Coalition, which has taken on that role since Fern died, uh, with an interest in energy conservation and efficient pricing. And all of them are the interveners. Once you're an intervener, you have the same rights to participate as anybody else. There are some times that people get limited intervention rights to address certain issues, but not all issues. The most interesting of them tends to be the industrial customers because in some states they get into the full case fighting the revenue requirement and the cost allocation between classes. In some states, 
they don't participate in the revenue requirement debate. Kroger grocery stores, for example, has a litigation team in greens and rate cases. They don't touch revenue requirements. Their goal is to make nice with the utility and support the utility's revenue requirements in exchange for the utility agreeing with them on cost allocation between classes and rate design within classes. And grocery stores tend to be open long hours, either 6 in the morning to midnight or 24 7. Uh, they have pretty high load factors and pretty even utilization factors, and they have a strong interest in screwing the office buildings. <laughs> the office buildings, the BOMA, tends to not be very involved uh, and spends what little time they have defending against Kroger. Uh, Another so group that can be interesting are the merchant power plants who try to get involved. Like out in Nevada, I know that's been an issue, and some other states where they try to intervene to be sure that they're going to have their chance. Uh -huh. but, you know that that this utility isn't getting everything going its way and kind of leaving them out in the cold in the bigger picture. Well, one thing that started happening is that. There are interveners who are actually competitors yeah, to the utility saying. or competitors to the utility's unregulated operation. Right. And there's become a lot more secrecy in rate cases than we used to have. And when I first started doing this, the utility would provide in discovery basically anything except customer-specific data. And they'd even provide the customer-specific data with just account numbers or identifying numbers and no names next to it. And we could pretty fi quickly figure out which ones were Boeings and which ones were warehousers. Uh, now there's multiple levels of secrecy in a rate case. There's confidential data and there's highly confidential data. And the highly confidential data tends to be the company's financial forecasts where knowing that information legally makes you an insider uh, in the SEC regulations, uh, and only certain, and typically only the commission and the consumer advocate are allowed access to the highly confidential data. Uh, the industrial customers scream bloody murder because they want the copies of the company's fuel, cl fuel contracts and things like that, and the utility refuses to give it to them because they know that the industrial customers are buying industrial fuel from the same companies, and they don't want them to have the knowledge of what the utility is paying, so the utility doesn't have access to what the industrial customers are paying. The amount of secrecy has just grown dramatically in the last 30 years. The last part of this is the hearing procedure. Rate cases can take anywhere from four months to 15 months, and part of it varies by state. Part of it, most states have statutes that require the commission to resolve a case in a anywhere between six months and 12 months. Uh, some states have a notice of intent to file requirement. You have to give advance notice. Obviously, the utility is putting together a thousand page filing, doing all the studies. Uh, it can take a while to put that together. Uh, so the utility knows it's going to do it, so giving a notice that it intends to file is not that big a deal. Uh, between the notice of an intent and the actual filing can be anywhere from zero to three months. The discovery process of sending interrogatories and information requests to the company can take one to three months. Filing your testimony and then the company filing its rebuttal testimony can take up to three months. The hearing before the commission Sometimes they're all scheduled in a compressed two-week period. Sometimes they first hear from the utility, and then there's another round of discovery before you have to uh, uh, go on the stand with your, your own testimony. So that can take up to a few months. The commission gets some time to make a decision. They typically insist on at least a month between when they get the briefs and, and the deadline for their decision. So we add it all up. Some cases are, are simple, are negotiated, are settled, and get resolved in as little as four months. Uh, 
Um, there was one case I did in Hawaii in 1996 where the commission finally issued a decision on it last year. So it was 13 years. Uh, it wasn't a rate, it was establishing the formula by which independent power producers would be paid for, for power. And the commission sat on the case for 10 years after we had settled all the two issues. So that's sort of what a rate case is, what it measures and what it does. I had planned to try and get into some other topics today. Uh, uh, one was uh, 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 so, sort of cost allocation and rate design, and the other was performance-based regulation. And we're sort of at the two-hour mark here, are we not? Yes. Yes, it's about. So I assume everybody has planned their day around two hours here, so we should... Uh, I'll send that stuff off to Wayne, and he'll decide where, where, if and where it fits into our curriculum first. <coughs> um, uh, in terms of the next session, I think there may be scheduling issues to try to do the next session in August. So I'm thinking session two will be sometime in September, and then we'll schedule from there. Great. That sounds good. All right. Now, do I get to see the evaluation of all this, Wayne? Uh, of course. If there were one, you'd get to see it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I will email out these slides as soon as we're, we're uh, offline. Uh, and uh, we'll reconvene again when we can. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Alrighty. Thanks, Everybody. Jim.